Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today's reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 through 26. Okay. It's about the rich young ruler. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you should not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things have I kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell all that you have and give to the poor, that you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he was had great possessions. Jesus said to him and to his disciples, Assuredly I say to you, that it is hard for a man, a rich man, to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Good to see everyone today. And uh, we're going to ask everyone to bow your heads and your hearts. Welcome to Ecourse Community Bible Church. And uh, now we have the opportunity to ask the Lord's blessing on the morning message. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be here this Lord's Day and uh, for each that have come and those that are listening in. <clears throat> we love you. And uh, we pray that your spirit might uh, anoint this message and uh, bring to us the truth concerning the subject from your word and for your will. Bless your word as it goes forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, let's see if I can figure what the message uh, title of the message is. <clears throat> now, wait a minute, it's up here. Uh, God's will and money. Tony called me this morning and he says, what's the title of the message, Pastor, so he could put it up here? And I just told him, money. I got off the phone, I got a little convicted. We're talking about money. And then I thought, we want to know God's will about money. So I called him back. Didn't I, Tony? Yep. And I said, could you put that uh, God's will in money? Okay. And now listen, you know, you might, you might consider that odd uh, that uh, I thought of that and maybe was even convicted about that. But there are a number of churches that are all excited about money. I hope there's nobody here that's all excited about money. We're going to talk about that today. And, and what Frank had read there was the passage uh, that also concerned uh, about money, a rich guy that uh, it became his idol. So, um, is money good or bad? Okay, you know, we've got various answers, don't we? But it's, it's, it's neither moral or immoral. If you've got money in your pocket, it doesn't make you more moral, it doesn't make you more immoral. It's amoral if you've ever heard that word before. It just doesn't have a moral connotation. Uh, it's what you do with it or what your heart feels about it that makes it moral or immoral. It is presently a necessary tool. It won't be a necessary tool in heaven. Presently it is. And it's to be used to purchase and accomplish things. To meet needs and also desires and wants. Okay. Uh, so we, we need to talk about money in a biblical way, okay? Wisdom. We need wisdom. There's two types of wisdom. There's godly wisdom and there's worldly wisdom. 
and uh, principles of wisdom to live by. Worldly wisdom is something that will have worldly results. Godly wisdom is something that will have godly results, godliness. So that's important to, to start right there. A man who is operating without godly principles and moral motivation will always end in coming short of God's standards. Always. If, you're, if we, are, we can operate in the flesh, there's only one group that can operate in the flesh or the spirit. Only one. Christians. Because we still have our body which gravitates downward. The body of sin. But we have our spirit that's enlightened if we're saved, truly saved. And this is important for us to think about this. We can operate in the spirit or we can operate in the flesh. We can operate in a worldly manner or in a godly manner. And that subject of money is significant. The Bible tells us it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Okay? Operating according to godly wisdom will always result in living by God's standards for success. You cannot end up in a place that is in God's uh, uh, in opposition to God's will if you're operating by the Spirit and it's our choice. So, it's important to us to operate to understand the principles that uh, God has for us concerning money. 1 Timothy 6.3, there's a, our, my first verse, right? 1 Timothy 6.3 6, 3, speaks of God's wisdom as, and what is God's wisdom as in this passage? The words of Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Where do we have the words of Christ? Do we have to go into the Gospels? Yeah, we can go into the Gospels and find the words of Christ. Listen. The words of Christ and doctrine. Christ's word is no more inspired as the rest of the Bible. In the New Testament, every word is inspired by God in the New Testament. Not just the words that Christ spoke. The words that Christ spoke don't have any greater inspiration than the rest of the scriptures. All Scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. The absolute pneuma. God breathed in the hearts of men. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, Peter tells us. And so, in order to have success, we need to live by God's standards, which are found in what? Are you listening? The Scriptures. At this church, if you come here, you've learned that uh, all the time is that we want to know what is God's will, not what is the pastor's will or the denomination's will. Okay, don't get confused. Therefore, having money by itself is not an answer or solution to solve all our needful situations. Having money. Somebody says, yeah, but I wish I had a lot more of it. Do you? Or do you wish you would have God's will? There's a difference. Somebody, again, I want to say that. Somebody says, I wish I could have a lot more of it, Pastor. And somebody's sitting there and they're thinking, yeah. Or I could use a little, Pastor. Is that wrong? <laughs> a little more? Here's what is right. God's will is determined in His mind and in His heart through His Word and in our particular situations. And sometimes having more money is not His will. So we want to be in this perfect world. We're going to talk about a man a little bit today as well as scripture. His name is George Mueller. He found out that truth. Money was only a tool that could be used for the kingdom of God and to meet the needs. That was it. And uh, somebody, a lot of you know who George Mueller is and others of you don't, but I think that you're going to be uh, interested to hear his testimony. What can money bring? Think about it. It can bring happiness. <coughs> Temporary, thank you. Fleeting, fleeting. You know what fleeting reminds me of? Fleeing. Whatever happiness that you have that's based upon money by itself is gone quickly. 
Just like our lives, the vapor of smoke and vanisheth in but a short while, like the grass that withered, the flower that fadeth, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. And so those people that, that are living for happiness think that it can be achieved by more money. Again, you know, I'm looking at your faces and you, some of us are thinking, yeah, but pastor, I could use a little more. I think that too. I think, gee, I, I could use a little more. Some of us, man, I could use a lot more. <laughs> Which is, listen, it's okay to think that. But the, but the thing is, is submitting our will to Him according to the Scriptures. He, he's got it. Remember that was a message uh, that we gave recently. Is God says, I've got it. I have it for you. We're in His hands. He's going to take care of us. Now, for some of us, we're not going to be able to put these pieces together as we go over this. Some of us are going to listen to these words, and it's not going to uh, have the same effect upon those who are saved. Some of us are going to misunderstand this. Well, why do I say that? Here's the verse we start off with. 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 Corinthians 2.14. What does that say? Anybody? The unbelievers, the natural man, cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Maybe I said it too quick. But the person who's not born again is going to hear these words, and it's kind of like in one ear and out the other, and it's not going to make, have an effect in our life. Okay, so that's why every time we come to the Word of God, we need to listen carefully. All right. Money can bring happiness temporarily. How so? We can buy things that make us more comfortable. Okay? How does that work? Why don't we just start with cars? You know, when I was a young person and I was saved, Tony remembers that, and that goes back <laughs> decades. All right. Uh, I, my dad was frugal. He wasn't cheap. He was frugal. And he always took care of my needs. Yes. But he told me, when you get a job, you can start paying board. And I was 16 years old. And his, his uh, brother also told his son, I learned just in the past few years, you've got a job, and he's just a teenager, still in high school, you're going to start paying board. Now, he didn't charge me... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an awful lot. It was very, according to what I made, proportionally. That, that, that's, that's our Heavenly Father. Proportionally is what we give. Are you listening? Okay. It's not like we have to give $1,000, but we give according to our hearts and grace. All right. Uh, so <clears throat> when it was time for me to go to work, and I did, and I may have first gone, as Doug did, on my bicycle to McDonald's. Uh, that's how I got there. And when I got enough money, $300, I bought a used car. And uh, my dad didn't help on that. He didn't help on the insurance. You say, oh, your dad wasn't as nice as my dad. <laughs> no, he taught me the importance of responsibility so that every day I understood it was important for me to be working. In fact, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 says what? If you don't work, don't plan on coming to the table. My dad taught me that. That's what the Bible says. Let's live in wisdom, godly wisdom, by the principles of God. Now, you don't do that to a little five-year-old kid. But you do teach him responsibility to make you bad. That's the mom's. That's what the mom said. Your bed's not made. I knew what that meant. I better get in there because uh, I knew that uh, who was in charge. What can money bring? We can live places that have greater status and power we can have greater benefits if we have enough money. We can have greater security, greater retirement, so, so to speak, protection. I was looking at uh, Elon Musk, the richest man in the world, on YouTube, and he's got at least six bodyguards when he goes places. And it's millions of dollars a year. Then they went to Jeff Zuckerberg. And he has, pays more money than what uh, Elon does. That's because he's a jerk. <laughs> no, we love him. He's, he's, he's somebody that needs to be saved. Amen. Amen. Yes. Uh, 
Also, if you have a lot of money, you can have greater, I'm going to say it, fulfillments, but I want to add something. Physical fulfillments, not spiritual. Unless you are giving that money. Boy, I'm excited about getting money so that I can put it in the Lord's work. I am excited about getting money so I can put it in the Lord's work. Now, I want to meet my needs and I want to scale down my needs so that I can give more. Is it because it says that in the Word of God? Yes. But hang on. It's not just because it says it in the Word, word of God. It's because I have the Spirit of God lives in me and my heart makes me. It is in the Word of God. We do need to learn what the Bible says. We don't go to church so that we can give money so that we can get more. You know, that's, that's not true. You know the, the, the verse that's found in Malachi 3.10. Malachi 3.10. It says that uh, you've robbed me of my tithes, uh, but if you give your tithes then, um, to, to the storehouse, then see if I will not open the windows of heaven and give you a blessing such as you won't be able to receive. How do you apply that to today? And there are a lot of churches or ministers that uh, say, you know, uh, that's a verse right there. You just give your tithe and you're going to get a blessing from God such as you cannot receive. The windows of heaven will pour out upon you and you'll find all of your needs, all of your blessings, all of well, those are two good words, but all that you want, that's what people think. Now, in the Old Testament, and I have to say this quickly because I don't want to get bogged down on it. In the Old Testament, they had a, an earthly kingdom. The Jews did. They were promised the Canaan land. And they were promised prosperity if they honored God and uh, if they gave their tithe and if they lived that life, then they were going to be blessed earthly blessings wait till the millennium on earth in their bodies that are not regenerated at the end of the tribulation period and I've said some words some of you might not understand but there's coming a day that when the Jews are come out of the tribulation period that they're going to go into the holy land there's only one holy land it's uh, Canton, Michigan where Pastor Lou lives <laughs> okay, I was there last night watching uh a play that Brooklyn was the star in that, and, and Deb and Doug and Jonathan were there, and she did the best out of all the other uh, actors and actresses. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, they had some beautiful buildings there. It was the uh, Canton Village Theater and the, the, the surroundings and the houses and everything, and I'm thinking, this doesn't look like Canton, but this is the good side of Canton. And, uh, but that's not the Holy Land, friends. There's only one play, Jerusalem. And that's it. Uh, <clears throat> and so that they had earthly prosperity, friends. It was promised to them as they lived for the Lord. They had earthly prosperity. Look at it, King David. They, I think it was King Solomon is the richest, maybe the richest man that ever lived. It's still debatable. Sorry, Elon Musk. <laughs> they said he might have been worth in, in the uh, with the gold that they had and the riches, maybe a trillion dollars worth. And of course, they didn't count that high. Uh, and it was a blessing to be a child of God and to honor God and to give your tithes and you could have blessing. Well, you know, that's not for... Listen, uh, Malachi 3.10 is not for the church, friends. We don't have an earthly blessing. We don't have that type of um, promise so that we can get rich. So that the, the things that are around us and everything will uh, uh, cause us to prosper and God is going to give us all this money. And so pastors, uh, some pastors in the Health, Wealth, and Prosperity group tell you that, that, oh yeah, just give a thousand dollars or give, you know, let's see, how many, um, how many uh, verses are there in the book of Revelation? Uh, 404. Well, God told me if you give $404, this this morning that you're going to be blessed abundantly according to Malachi 3.10, they're going to quote it. No. That's a joke. So hang on. Um, listen. God wants us to have what we need. 
You know what he tells us what we need? Food and clothes. Where does it say that? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And it says this, seek ye first. That's the, that's the, uh, that is the predominant, most important part of God meeting our needs is seeking Him first. Okay, in everything, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. And of course, the health, wealth, and prosperity take. Boy, they take that out of uh, context. And they tell you, you know, all these things. What things? Food and clothes. And also your needs. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath no, no place to lay his head. Even a fox has a place where he can go to and rest. Even a bird has a nest that uh, he or she can go to and rest as a home. But the Son of Man hath no place to rest his head. Well, wait a minute. Is God not going to meet our needs? Uh, for rest, yes. And for Jesus, did he? Oh, yeah. That's why, you know, Mary and Martha and Lazarus were so important. Because every time he came there to uh, minister, he had a place and they took him in. And the Bible tells us also that a person who gives a prophet a cup of cold water will also be blessed himself, will receive the reward of the prophet. And so that family, because they honored the prophet or because they offered, honored Jesus, were going to be blessed both in this life and the life to come. So was, did God not care about Jesus? Are you kidding? God loved his son so much, but he met his needs. Same with the apostles. It's, it's miraculous. I'm going to get to this George Mueller in a minute because of the things that happened in his life, and he's just a guy like you and me. But he learned the principles from the Word of God. Okay, um, so I want to read uh, a couple of uh, verses here when Jesus is talking about money. Um, oh, I probably should say that can money bring joy? We know that money can bring happiness. There's a happiness between joy and money. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's His joy that brings me strength. But a happiness is based upon circumstantial things. And they can change. But the, my joy, if it's His joy, then I have, uh, it, it's, it's without uh, end. Oh, I found that when I'm in the hospital, <laughs> this last year I'm more in the hospital than I've ever been in my entire life. But I had joy... I had the Lord, and it was an opportunity to be able to witness. I had pain, I had suffering, I had questions, but I had joy. I had joy. When my dad died, uh, it was probably the hardest death I had to face. I was a teenager. He was our foundation, did everything, you know. Good man, raised us in the Lord. When he died, that's the hardest death. I, what about your mom? Wasn't, wasn't your mom's death hard? No. It was hard, but not like my dad's. Why? Because uh, I was a Christian, but only a couple years a Christian. And it was hard because I wasn't used to uh, meeting needs and having the Lord use uh, the words of God to help me to meet the needs. Now, this is important. So when he died, uh, I had the joy of the Lord. But uh, it, it uh, was carrying a burden on my shoulders that for two years I carried that burden on my shoulders. You can call it some depression. Well, how can you have depression and have joy at the same time? It's the same way you can have joy when you're suffering. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the trial of your faith worketh patience and patience proof. The joy of the Lord is there. I've had different times where I faced my hardest trials in my life. And I went through a couple years of depression then, but I went through a couple years of depression another time while I was in uh, Detroit Bible College and went out to Mexico and uh, took something back with me that uh, uh, caused me pain for two years. And there was some depression there. There were, were some hardships as a young, young man uh, in my early 20s. But the joy of the Lord was there. I was in church all the time. I was so happy because the church, boy, our, our church... Remember, uh, Wayne, 
we had, uh, uh, I was there sometimes seven and eight times. Pastor Blue knows because he was there. A week! And I loved it. So, the point is, is that the joy of the Lord is different than happiness, which is fleeting. The joy of the Lord, it's not my joy, it's his joy that he gives me while I go through what I have to go through. Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, that was Nehemiah 8.10, this is 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. And what does it say, 1 Timothy 6.6? 6? It says, godliness with contentment is great gain. I seek to have contentment in my uh, life through godliness, through Him. And when I veer off that path a little bit or whatever, there's not contentment. There's, there's a, a, you know, some falling. There's some, re which comes with regret. But when I am on that path, I have, I seek contentment with God. And godliness with contentment is great gain. There's a verse in the Bible. There's three verses in the Bible in Psalm 73. This is important. Verses 23 through 26, you've probably heard me share this before. Nevertheless, thou art continually with me. What, what are you going through? Something has happened in your life. Uh, things aren't going the way. You've got bills. You might lose your house. You might lose your car. You don't have a car. Etc., etc., etc. You fill in the lines yourself. Nevertheless, God says, I am continually with thee. Regardless of the circumstances that you face, I am continually with thee. Thou shalt guide me by thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Then watch this. Who do I have in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth I desire besides thee. My heart faileth and my flesh faileth, but thou art my Thou art my substance. Thou art my all in all. Thou art my fulfillment. And that's, uh, that, what's that? That's Psalm 73, 23 through 26. You are my fulfillment. We can't be fulfilled by another person. We can't be fulfilled by any other thing. We can only be fulfilled by God. Let's seek Him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness. And that's Jeremiah 39 and 9. And what does that say? Yeah, 39 and 9, it says, Seek, uh, they that seek me, they shall find me if they seek me with their whole heart. Okay. The joy of the Lord is my strength, and that's what I'm seeking. What is your strength today? What makes you happy? What brings you joy? Okay, this is, a, this is a little lesson today in, uh, in Sunday church. If it's from His Word, it's from Him. Okay, so we have to sit here under whatever conditions. In fact, you think that I share along, and I'm, I'm getting ready to wrap things up. Somebody says, oh yeah. Um, you think that I'm long, and, I'm, and, and I only go 32 to 42 minutes. Uh, you want to hear somebody, that, uh, you just go to uh, Chuck Missler and he'll, nine hours one Bible study. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, when's this going to end? That was like Paul the Apostle, yes. who he was preaching and preaching, he preached all day long and the guy fell asleep and he fell off the balcony and died. Yes. That's why we don't have a balcony here. That's what the Bible says, don't have a, a balcony if you preach long. Or wait a minute, it doesn't say that. Uh, and you know what Paul did? He, he was so in tune with the Lord as he went over there. He probably said, don't worry about this, guys. I got, God's got it. He went over there and he prayed over him. The guy rose from the dead. Our God is good. Amen. Our God is good. Listen, so, what is your strength? Psalm 20 and verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. Back then that was their mode of transportation. And I mean, you could see in... Uh, Sam's driveway, his chariot, and boy, you could see down the road here in Bill's uh, uh, driveway, his chariot, and you could see the stallions in this guy's backyard, and you could see them in that one and what have you. And I mean, uh, some of them cost uh, 10000 and some were costing 50000 and some were, 
costing 150000 and I'm only giving you relative terms that would compare with what people are living for today. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of Yahweh our God. Where does it say that? Psalm 20 and verse 7. I want to remember His name. I want Him to know that I want to seek Him and His righteousness. But this can only happen with a blood-bought, born-again believer if you're genuinely saved because otherwise we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. And what does it say? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, because why? They are spiritually discerned. That's why we better check ourselves. Are we really saved? Is this going in one ear and going out the other? I mentioned before about the heart, one of the, the, the hardest person that I can remember that was taken from me was uh, my father, and I was there by his side at 1 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> in February, just after his birthday, a couple days after his birthday, the last thing he said to me was, praise the Lord. And he was hemorrhaging, and blood was coming out of his nose, and he pulled his uh, IV out, and was restless, and everything. Uh, and I was there, and Brother Doug was there. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, on a Saturday, and I was just a teenager, and, uh, but I knew the Lord, and uh, I went to Warndale the very next day. It was uh, Sunday, was uh, church, and had to uh, drive a bus and pick up kids and so forth. That, my dad's death didn't, didn't stop that. I committed it to my Lord. I went to the Sunday school. I might have taught and passed for Blue Sunday school class. I don't know. He was probably teaching, uh, but uh, it didn't matter. And that week, I still was in church five, six, seven, eight times. In, in bus evangelism, in evangelism that I had learned at the church, etc., etc., and because the joy of the Lord kept me through that, and I had a joy because I knew He was in heaven. But it was hard because I didn't understand all of the principles of God completely, but I had it in my heart and my soul. All right. Uh, when my mom died, on the other hand, he was only uh, 56 years old, I think, uh, 57, and but when my mom died, she was 89, half a year absent from 90 years. But at the same time, she'd lived such a godly life. Oh my goodness! Any of you that know my mom, she was ready. And I remember when she had a little heart attack out, it was a snowy day, and 11 years ago, and she fell down, and Bernie was with her and another man, and they just come from uh, someplace. And uh, they picked her up, brought her in, and uh, she really was gone. And she had a heart attack. And I, I thought, you know, boy, I'm going to miss my mom. Because I'd lived with her all my life. Boy, I'm going to miss my mom. And I still miss her. But I had a peace that passes understanding to keep my heart and mind through Jesus Christ. It wasn't as hard as my dad. And I'd been with her way longer than I'd ever been with my dad. But I was so happy that she didn't have to suffer the way that she died. And it was the same thing with Paul over here. I'm pointing at his picture. Because I knew he was present with the, In fact, I knew when I was there, God was talking to him before he left his body. <laughs> and, uh, you know, think about this. And this is kind of getting off the subject, but it's trusting God. Is that the troubles that you have right now and the suffering that you face right now and the things that you go, and the food that doesn't taste as good as it used to, or you can't smell the things, and you got the pains in places you didn't even know you had, and they're just multiplying and so forth, this and that, and you're thinking, I'm thinking this, Paul doesn't have to go through that. He's filled with joy. So it's good to know the Lord, and it's good to be able to trust Him. And so uh, I, I want to read uh, just a little bit of this about George Mueller and, and, and close. He's a favorite uh, hero of mine, and uh, I've tried to follow his example in trusting the Lord the way that he has to some degree, but don't match up to him. Uh, he wasn't after money. He was after God. George Mueller, 1805, he was born. 1898, he died. He was 93 years old when he died. George Mueller was asked, what's the secret of your service to God? Mueller's response was this, there was a day when I died utterly died, 
died to George Mueller. Try to apply this to your own thinking about yourselves. Can you die to yourselves? This is important. If you can die to yourselves, then you can live for God. I died to George Mueller, his opinions, his preferences, his taste, his will. I died to the world, its approver and sent approval and censure. I don't have if I'm following God's will and genuinely following God's will, I don't even have to wonder about what the other pastors think about me. Um, that's what George is saying here. Died to approval or blame, even of my brethren and friends. And since I've studied to show myself approved only to God, I must attend to every day to fellowship with the Lord. What's the first thing you do when you get up? Right. After you eat breakfast. Okay. Some of us eat, say, oh, I'm so hungry, i got to eat something. Uh, and then you get on your knees. Okay, but it's putting God first. The first concern is not how much I might serve the Lord but how my inner man might be nourished. It's not a physical sense of uh, fulfilling some works. It's how can I find blessing from God and my heart will then cause me to live this life for Him. And he says here, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. If you can do something in your flesh and get it done, you don't need any faith. Most often. And that's what he's saying here. Faith, faith doesn't operate in the realm of the possible. There's no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. We must trust him to go forward even when the tests that come to, to our life are um, so difficult. That's the time we trust him. You see this uh, building round about you. That's how this building came. But it didn't come overnight. It didn't come with a week's worth of prayers. It came through, listen, there was uh, at least a year or two years of fasting. Not all at once. Don't uh, look at me that way, Wayne. It wasn't all fasting. It was fasting for two years, but every Monday. Here's an example. Uh, four years have passed since I began to trust in the Lord alone for the supply of temporal needs. All I had then at most was worth 100 pounds a year. That's maybe 150 bucks. Uh, our, he from England. I gave it up to the Lord and had nothing left but five pounds. Five, uh, seven, eight bucks. Where's that 10%? I mean, aren't we, you know, 10% 10, 10 people? No, we're not 10% people. Is there a 10% principle? Yeah, you can honor God when you give the 10%. And He'll bless you. However, that's not the New Testament giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. What are we talking about today? God's will concerning money. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 tells us grace giving. You don't have to give a penny. And it says in 2 Corinthians 9, it says not to give begrudgingly, not to give of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you can't give it cheerfully, you're not operating in the Spirit, and God is not going to bless you. He's tired of your offerings. He tells the Old Testament folk of the following through with the uh, lambs that they're offering and doing everything precisely right, and that was the church at Ephesus. I know your works. But your passion, your love is missing. Repent, or I'll take your light out. Grace giving, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And that's what uh, uh, George Mueller had learned. Um, during these last three years, three months, I've never asked anyone for anything. I want to live that way, and uh, I try to live that way, and I, I, I don't remember, by God's grace, asking anyone for any, anyone, anyone for anything. Even about the $10,000 that we're trying to raise for the building fund, I'm not saying how much can you give. The bio, the, our bulletins don't say that. It says we're raising $10,000. Now we can participate in that. We don't have to. Because you know what I have found is that even in the past couple of years, we've given $20,000 last year to missions. I, I added it up and we're about $10,000 in missions right now. Close to it. 
and that'd be twenty thousand dollars this year. And so it'd be between twenty and twenty-five percent of our money is going to go towards mission. And even when we have such great needs, and I don't say please, let's please give money, please. You know, you, some of these programs, ministers that you've seen on television that uh, say, you know, the ministry's going to close down if you don't give some money. You know, like God is not capable of keeping it open. The people that have told me that have given me, given our church, the greatest amounts of money have not, get, have not given it because I asked them or because we sent out a letter and said, please give us some money. Could you give us some money? No. Pray and thank you for the money you have given us. That's, those are our letters. You have helped us to sustain this. You've listened to God's, God's word and to his voice. But here's what they've said. That have given, you know, uh, twelve thousand dollars here, uh, uh, several thousand dollars over here. They said God put it on my heart, and they don't go to our church. And I think of the names of people that have done that, and how that God raised up uh, uh, institutions one time, uh, thirty-six thousand dollars. Another institution, eight thousand five hundred dollars. And so the point is, is that God is able, and God built this building because we have the whole city, not the whole city, but the government against us. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, wickedness in high places. So let's trust God. All right. I guess I, I can skip a whole lot of things and come down to this last paragraph. In addition to caring, he had orphans, thousands of orphans. Over 10,000 orphans by the time that he was done. And he paid for the printing of Bibles and tracts. He gave more than 250,000 Bibles out. He paid tuition for hundreds of children to go to school. During his lifetime, in answer to the prayer, in answer to prayer, he raised the equivalent of $129 million. And back then, that would be easily $500 million, half a billion dollars in our day. Easily. Which he gave away. He didn't say, well, that's $129 million. I can uh, get, improve my house, or I can improve my chariot, or my horses. He didn't. No, he wasn't that far back. But uh, I can improve something. But it says when he died, he only had a little money. When he died, think of these uh, health, wealth, and prosperity. Look, look on YouTube. YouTube, find out uh, they're living in. Multi, multi-million dollar homes. They're, they're buying jets for themselves. They're buying all of these things. It's a Ponzi, religious Ponzi scheme. Don't send a quarter to them. My goodness, please. The trust he set up continues to support, to support missionaries around the world. It also holds the record for the most of the nearly 18,000 children cared for during the 150 year life of the orphanage. 18,000 children. He didn't live for 150 years, but this orphanage went on beyond him, and uh, it met all of their needs over the 150 years. So, concluding. Yes. <coughs> what needs do you have? You say, I'm struggling. Seek you first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, all these Needs will be taken care of, but you've got to seek Him. And His righteousness. Are you saved? You're not going to have your prayers answered if you're not saved. And secondly, you're not going to have your prayers answered if you're out of His will. Romans 8.32 He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not freely give us all things? All things that we need. He spared not His Son. How can He not also, who he delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things? Uh, let's see, what was the title? God's will and money. Trust him. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack anything. That's what it says. I shall not want, I shall not lack anything. The Lord is my shepherd. I pray that prayer every day. I say, God, you're my shepherd. Thank you that I don't lack anything. I don't need anything that you will not provide for me if it's a need. I lack nothing. 
including my body with the things that I go through or what have you. He's there in his timing. He's going to take care of me until it's ready for him to take us home. We don't know when, but it was Paul's December 13th. And, and, and I rested in that. His death was not a real hard thing. He went right home to be with the Lord. And I'm the one left in suffering because my body's, you know, has some problems. Uh, but I thank God that I can get up here and I can still serve the Lord and that He's going to give me grace and that if I can apply these truths that are in the Word, and here's an example, George Mueller, that He is going to be there. I don't care what the problem is or what the financial situation is. His will must be done. It's not this passage, ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it on your lust. What is money? Just a means for us to do things, get things done according to God's will. And if it doesn't get done and we're in His will, then, uh, that's, not, then, then that's not His will. Uh, I have three principles that He gave, and I'm going to write it up. I didn't write it up because they're worth uh, listening to. Three principles with regards to money, and I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'll, I'll let you uh, be a little bit hungry about that. Because they're great uh, biblical principles, and we'll do that another time. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to uh, come before your presence. We've got in our title, God's Will and Money. That's it. It's yours. Everything we have is yours. All of it, how are we using it? It's not 10%. Boy, I've given 10%. If, if we could only say we've given 10%. That's small. But by your grace, help us, Lord, so that whatever we give proportionately, that it's going to be for your glory. And all that we have is yours. And so let's be about the business of getting souls saved. And for the kingdom, and especially in the light of your soon return. And thank you, Father, for your presence, your guidance, and your love. Pray if anyone doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, boy, now's the time to call out, oh God, give me a desire to repent, Holy Spirit, that I might place my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior alone for salvation. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.